Hi everyone, hope you're doing well. In this video we're going to take a bit of a look at forams, foraminifera, uh, which are really cool little single cell creatures that live on the bottom of the ocean or float around in the middle. And the cool thing about them is they've got ectoplasm. Forams are these tiny single celled creatures. They live on the bottom of the ocean floor and also uh, floating around in the water column. The ones that live on the bottom of the, the ocean, they dig around in the ooze looking for things to eat and they kind of grab onto things using pseudopods. Pseudopods are these fake legs that they kind of just stick out of these holes in their little shells that are called tests. The, the shells are called tests, not the legs. And the material that these pseudopods are made from is called ectoplasm. And those of you that have watched Ghostbusters might recognize that as the product from ghosts. So I wonder if the, the names are related. If you know, leave a comment. And you can see they come in a variety of sizes. There's all sorts of sizes. A lot of disc shaped ones um, and then ones shaped like balls. Uh, a lot of them remind me of golf balls and then these longer ones that are really weird and cool. We've got a few of these cool micro fossil holders. So it's got a microscope slide over the top to protect them and when you want to look at them, just slide that away and then put it under the microscope. You can see how tiny these forearms are. Each of those squares is about five millimeters by four millimeters. They're very tiny. These are quite expensive to get hold of, these uh, micro fossil holders. So I've 3D printed myself some. And it works just the same. This is a prototype. I just need to add the numbers into it. Yeah, it's got the slide. And then it fits in like that. It's a really nice fit. So once you've got the slide on there, it doesn't go anywhere. You can shake it around. It stays there. If you want to know about forums in New Zealand, this is the book to get. It's got really great uh, sketches of them. You can identify them. Well, <laughs> if you know enough about them, you can identify them. But some of the, the ones are unique enough to be able to identify. The cool thing about forearms and why you want to find them and identify them is that you can use them to date an area. So if you look over here, not so much with the benthic ones. So benthic forearms are the ones that live on the ocean floor, but more with the planktic ones, the ones that float around in the water. Let's find it. Yeah, we've got a diagram for the uh, planktic ones, the ones that float around in the water, and they're really useful for telling the, the date of an area. So at the top here they've got the stages, the New Zealand stages, which are different to the international ones. Um, but yeah, what I found easier for me, because I don't know <laughs> the exact dates of each of these, I just kind of translate them into something like this. So let's say you've got um, for this area, let's say you've got 20 million over here and about 5 million here and then you just mark them off so 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 and then every time I find a 4M so let's say I find 4M A over here I go look it up over here and I see, oh, here it is and it only was found from 10 to let's call it 18 18 million years ago so that's quite a large um, <laughs> time span there but now if I find 4MB another one a different one let's say this one is from 8 to 11 and I'm really lucky and I find some more and it's 4MC and it's from 
nine to let's say this one goes on till present day and then what I do is I look for the area of overlap so you see they overlap over there and that is from 10 to 11 million years ago and that gives you quite a good estimate for how old this area is just based on the the forums that you find there what you don't want to get <laughs> is you find 4m <laughs> d who's only from like this section over here <laughs> and there's no overlap but yeah hopefully you find ones that have got nice overlap and then you get a pretty decent um, idea of the age i've probably simplified it a lot and missed out on some key points but this is how i understand it if i miss something please let me know in the comments i'd love to learn a bit more i've been working on these forums for probably about two months now and you can see each of these slides has got 50 on them they're very very tiny and if you look inside there that's just one of my other batches and there's there's literally thousands in here and identifying them takes ages and I'm like surely there's a better way of doing this so it got me thinking about some machine learning uh, that I've seen done so I thought you know let's give it a go let's see if we can figure something out well the first step was to find a data set so I went over to Endless Forums, which is an awesome site. It's got planktic forums um, and a really large number of photos and images of them. And you can see some of them, I think Ruba over here, has got almost 6,000 images. So that's a great data set. Uh, the only problem was this is over in Stanford, <laughs> which is a fair distance away from New Zealand. So I couldn't download it for some reason. It was just timing out. So I actually had to create a virtual machine close to Stanford, download it to that one, and then download it to New Zealand in batches. But if you look in here, there's just some really, really good images in here. So it's a, this is the ideal data set. So I've got them all downloaded, and these are the ones that I found had enough images in it to train, so more than 100. And then I've got a few here with smaller, smaller numbers. So you can see this one only has, uh, well, maybe, you know, I can train on this one. Um, but if we go look at this one, it's only got a very small number of images in there. So after I downloaded them, I looked at the images and you can see over here that each of the images, while they're really good quality, uh, they've got this white block down here with additional information in there. And that was just going to confuse the machine learning algorithm. So the next step was to try and automatically find this area here where the forum is and extract that image. Uh, I didn't want to do all 30,000 uh, myself manually so I created a Python script for it um, and what it does if you run it over here you'll see that firstly I, I bring uh, add a bit of blur to it and I really increase the contrast uh, just so I can get some good delineation on the edges here then I'll use this canny feature uh, to just grab the edge and then it finds the biggest area so this one over here in the middle this nice little 4M shape it enclosed the 4M and that was the biggest area it found so I drew a square around it and then cropped it for me so that was a lot easier and quicker than doing it myself and it gave pretty good results I also turned it into black and white because I don't want the color to actually affect it. I don't think I needed to do that, but I thought, let me just do it now. Um, I will say I'm no Python expert, so this is probably a lot longer <laughs> and a lot more verbose than it needed to be. But yeah, it's fun. Um, I didn't tell it how to do that. Uh, all those little things um, are built into Python, so finding the edges like that, that's a built-in feature, adjusting the contrast, doing the uh, area of interesting and doing the crop that's all built-in features so uh, don't be too impressed that I was just <laughs> using something that someone else had built so in essence I turned these images you know these color images with the little uh, white box at the bottom there into something I can use to train on and if you go look here I've got source images if you look here I've got a training data set over here, so let's go look at 
this one and you can see the you know, the image is now without that white box at the bottom with the additional information um, st some of the images are still a little bit uh, messy you can see this one's got another 4m coming in at the bottom so not an ideal data set but it's good to have a data set that's a little bit messy just so that your model can deal with real world situations and then I trained it on that so you've got the training data set so 80% of the images go in the training data set and 20% I put into the validation training set so this is what it will try and validate against and we'll just keep on doing that until it finds a model that works really well uh, the steps I just talked about probably took me two weeks <laughs> of you know working after hours and just uh, getting it done and it left me with a pretty good data set. I've got about 25,000 images in there, uh, which is a good number to train something with. Now that I had the data set, I had to come up with a model to train it with. Uh, so of course, at first I tried to do it myself uh, from scratch. It turned out to be really, really difficult. Next, I played around with a few image recognition models, uh, VGG16, VGG32, and a few others. And I came back to VGG16, the one that was used in the original paper. The paper was by A.J. Hsiang from about four years ago, yeah, 2019, where they actually used that same data set to create a model. And this model was getting a top one accuracy of 87% and a top three accuracy of 97%. And those images were from the Yale Peabody Museum and the Natural History Museum of London. These are a few images I found just on the internet and I can pop them in here, upload it. It takes a while to process it because like I say it's a it's a quite a slow virtual machine trying to keep the cost down. And you know after about 30 seconds it should pop out a result for us. And most of the time it's correct, you know, it's not hundred percent, but it's it's doing pretty well. Uh, the next step is to train it further. So you can see this one, it's 99% sure this is uh, a menor die. I'm going to say it's a menor die. Um, for him. And it's correct because uh, if you look here, this called Trata actually got me a little bit confused because I got this from a paper and I'm like, oh no, my machine uh, learning model is broken. It's a called Trata and it's come back with this menor die. So you can see over here, this is, uh, it's also called a menor die, so it looks like it's a synonym for it. So the, the coltrata is also called the menor die, so, so even though I was worried that the model was broken, it seemed pretty confident about that, and you can see this is a ruber. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, but uh, because I had so many images of this ruber, if we load that and just give it a, a moment to process it, it should come back with a pretty strong result for Ruber, just because it had a really nice big data set to train. There we go. So also 97% sure that it is a Ruber. Thanks so much everyone for joining me for that little bit of a different video. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, it's really cool playing around with those machine learning models. Uh, so these were four amps, but I'm hoping that the same technology can be used for something like shark teeth, because shark teeth can be quite tricky to tell apart. So if you get enough samples of shark teeth, uh, we can use the same technology for that. Let me give you a quick update on that turtle skull. It's in the water at the moment. Uh, so after each acid bath, it goes into water, fresh water for a few days. Uh, let me go take it out and we can have a look at it. What's cool is you can start seeing that middle part of the, the nose. Probably in a human that would be called a septum, but not sure about a turtle. Now I've just got a little bit more sediment to remove on this side. But otherwise it's starting to look almost done. I've fixed up all that glue that was here. You can see this is where the crack was going through it, which I've managed to repair. And it's got this really nice mark over here. It almost looks like a, a tooth. <laughs> I don't know if that is a bite from something, and I'm not sure if it happened before it died or after it died. But yeah, it's a very definite shape, triangular shape over there. Mm -hmm.